Jesus Arturo Perez Diaz, professor researcher of the Technological Center of Monterrey, Mexico, and Marcelo. Your name is a bit different, difficult. A triple A student and a PhD with a professor. They are going to bring a work that is called uh, Smart Framework for Preventing Attacks in the Networks. We'll have about 30 minutes. Thank you. Well, good morning. First of all, thank you for coming to this talk where we are going to describe the work that we've uh, uh, completed in the last two or three years, building an automated security framework. It seeks to automate security, applying both reactive and uh, proactive techniques to prevent the uh, DDoS attacks. Basic, the agenda. Basically, let me start with an introduction of the technologies in, used in this work, and then we'll talk about m traffic monitoring and intrusion detection in the framework. And then we'll go on uh, talking about the in intrusion prevention system, and finally, the physical deployment of what we did. This framework is based on SDN, or it's for SDN. And if you remember, the software-defined working, uh, software-defined networking, the SDN, uh, seeks to separate the control plan from uh, the data. So today, these networks, as you know, are used in new generation and 5G, and also in one. It is very common. Uh, to use it, and this is one of the reasons why we use it. We decided to study it. Then we have the DDoS attacks, just as ransomware. It's one of the attacks that has increased the most. As a matter of fact, in recent years, as a matter of fact, the substantial increase started with the pandemic in 2020, and it hasn't stopped uh, ever since. Basically, what these attacks seek is to stop availability of a service, of a server or a device, or even the bandwidth of a network. So when you execute it from a device, that is um, a denial of service attack. And when the uh, machines were compromised through a botnet earlier, then it's uh, distributed denial of service attack. So while the attack is taking place, a legitimate user, as could be the case, for instance, of this user that tries to access the server to request a service, if the attack is taking place right then, it will not be possible to attend. Another important thing to remember is that there are quite memorable attacks and DDoS attacks that were executed by uh, the Internet of Things devices. So, so I think it's very important to remember that any IoT device that we integrate in our network with an IP may be uh, a target to attacks anytime, so we must include it in all the security measures we use. The attacks we studied, this is a global classification of all the DDoS attacks. The white hole, gray hole in the network, the transportation layer, 
So, uh, and uh, with uh, the SIN flood and UDP flood, then we have the application layer that we study more in time. And here we have high and low volumes. Among the high volumes, we studied the DDoS text and uh, here are DDNS and the low volume, the slow body, slow headers, and slow head. Let me mention that among the interesting results, something that we could see was that the low volume ones are usually typically attacks that are much more difficult to detect. So starting with our models, where, where do we find these attacks in um, uh, public uh, places? Uh, 2017 for low range and 2019 for high rate. So both uh, data sets are belong to the uh, Canadian uh, Institute. Uh, they are public. Now, how does our framework work? What we did was to use the slick slow, uh, sick flow meter from the Canadian Institute of Cybersecurity to capture the traffic flow to reprocess it through a tool that was a flow manager in the controller. And from then, we passed that information to our detection server where we have the models that were previously trained. The selection of these models, of course, was based on the tests of the data sets. But basically, the part monitoring uh, the network consisted of uh, capturing the packets, creating the flows, and comparing them with the uh, ADS. The first part, once we had uh, the models trained, we presented this in the peer forum. We detected the models that behaved the best, the best performance. And quickly, you can, we could quickly see that among the best performers, the LSTM and GRU, and maybe the first conclusion of our work was that in the attacks, slow rate, as I just said, are a bit more difficult to detect, and consequently, the accuracy was a bit lower, as you can appreciate with uh, the attacks uh, of uh, thick uh, um, uh, CCDI DOS 2017. Then we decided whether it was an attack or not, and then the Motic class classification in this scenario, we validated whether it was an attack. It would say what kind of attack it was that was being executed. And if it was not attacked, then the model would answer zero to show that it was a benign traffic. So as I said, one of the relevant uh, con uh, conclusions is that the deep learning models behave a bit better in general terms. It's easier to identify a binary uh, um, a diagnosis if it's, it, if it's an attack or not. And the best uh, global performers were um, G GRU and LSTM. Then we tested these models in a controlled uh, model, the and we the owner's controller uh, with Mininet, and we saw that the ones that uh, performed better in the simulated deployment was LSTM and GRU, as you can see on this map page. As a matter of fact, you can appreciate. You may see that the bars, the two models, the bar in blue and in purple, those have the accuracy levels or a percentage of detection or a higher detection rate. So having identified the models that uh, had a better performance, we then designed the intrusion system. <laughs> So our initial architecture, which is practically a flow manager and an IDS, we added the IPS module. This module basically consisted in the fact that the switches were programmed so as to 
so that the data was sent mirrored to the flow collector. And the flow collector then used the same tool of the SIG flow. The features with which the model had been trained were then used. We applied a 30% filter, namely we only selected 30% of the flows, and this was done in order to make it scalable. So then the framework could work in a scenario with a much higher saturation. So once we had collected the flow and selected this 30%, we sent it to the IDS. This applied the ST LSTM, because which was the model with the best performance. And then the IDS assessed whether this was an attack or not. In the case of this being an attack, it was then passed to the IPS module based on deep reinforcement learning. And ultimately, in the case this were an attack, this system was monitored by the, by the device that was carrying out the attack so it could interact with the flow manager and at a given time would ask to add flow rules towards the switches so as to block that attacker temporarily. Now, to give you some more details on the deep reinforcement learning, I will now give the floor to Marcela, who was the student who worked with me throughout this process, this process of the project. So, thank you. This system we are proposing now, with, with the intention is to make this automated. So automating the detection part, the IDS will generate a whole set of alerts. So the security manager would not have the capacity to deploy the mitigation tool. So the idea is to have an automated cycle. We, the detection and then mitigation. Mitigation uses deep reinforcement learning. And basically all these need three components, namely which are the status, the reinforcement, and the actions that have to be carried out regarding the states. The most important one is the one that provides the detection part, the IDS. So if a connection is attack or a normal one. So this is a status that will be used by the people, by the guys who do reinforcement. And one of the other statuses is the status of the connections in the network, namely the bandwidth that was used by each of the links in the network. And among the actions, we considered some important ones which are blocking the attack, in other words, mitigating a connection, an attack connection. And another is to release the connections. But remember, the IDS is not perfect. So one of the greater disadvantages of the IDS, or one of the critical things of the IDS, are the false positives. This means that the IDS does reports a connection that might be benign, but the IDS considers this a, an attack connection. So if we did not have an adequate system, what we would do simply would be to block a legitimate connection. So this could be critical in a security system. So what we do here with reinforcement learning is that people learn based on the statuses we generate and the actions. And in the event of blocking a legitimate connection, the IDS then should learn or the reinforcement learning agent then recognize the ones that were illegitimately blocked before. Now, the mathematical detail of all this algorithm is how this learns. We use Q learning, and this is in the article that we'll be mentioning in the last slide. Regarding the experimentation stage, we use simulations as with a large number of devices. We are simulating a data center topology. We have two devices, two central devices or cores, and four below, four devices below. 
that are the switches at the bottom. We use a large number of servers, which we configured as attackers or legitimate senders. And we then simulated legitimate and attack traffic using different tools. In this slide, we show the performance of the system for detection and how the IDS detects this. We observed, well, we, we did experiments varying the number of attackers. And in this experiment, there was only one victim, which is the Apache server on the right. For one attacker, for four attackers, and for 24 attackers. And these are the results that we see in the charts A, B, and C. We also varied the r attack rate. And our approach was that when you have just one attacker who is trying to attack this system, the attack rate should be high in order to be effective with the attack. But when we increased the number of attackers, we can reduce the individual attack rate to obtain the same effect. So as a result, the larger the number of attacks in the system, the more difficult it is to detect these. So we observe that maybe there is like a decrease in the performance of the system when there is an increase in the number of attacks. So overall, the detection percentage was higher than 98%. And it is important to mention here that the detection rate decreased compared to the data sets shown by Jesus. So there are some considerations, namely that when we have data sets, some things are not taken into account compared to these cases where we do simulations. Regarding the mitigation module, this shows two results. One is a response time for mitigation because, of course, if we have a system that is efficient, it should be efficient in the response time. So for the same experiments with one attacker with four and 24 attackers, A, B, and C, so we see the performance in terms of the response times. And we look at the horizontal axis of the three graphs, you see here the attack rate. It's important to note here that when implementing the number of attackers, the longer the IPS takes to respond. As I said previously, this is because each of the attackers uses smaller attack rates. Therefore, for IDS, it will take longer and be more difficult to identify them and the entire system will therefore take longer to respond. At the bottom, we have a graph that explains the effectiveness of our system. We therefore defined a response limit, the response time, which is less than 30 seconds. We say that the mitigation system fails if the response time exceeds 30 seconds. This does not mean that the system is not mitigating. We have seen that the system always mitigates all the attacks, but we must set a response time, which was what we did here. And when we conduct this analysis, we realize that for one attacker and for four attackers, the efficiency is 100%. And for 24 attackers, this decreases. In other words, it takes longer than 30 seconds to respond to the attack. This can be clearly seen in the third bar, where the response time is more than 30%. Another important thing of our project is the deployment in a physical infrastructure. Although we went from data sets to simulations, we now want to test whether this works in a physical implementation. With this aim, last year, I was at a university where they have this Smart Networks for Industry Lab, SN41, where they deployed this lab to apply the same tautology you saw in the simulation. 
At the top, we have the two devices. In the middle, he connects himself with other two switches and the core, and below that, the four other devices. So we have we use three physical devices, and for the other devices, we virtualize this from a physical device. We obtained the same to topology compared to the one we used in the simulation. This is because using the short time we had available, the idea was to deploy the architecture using the same models that we had trained with the data sets that Jesus explained, namely to use the same models and to show the deployment and how the architecture worked in a real situation. We also used several computers, microcomputers, and microservers as end users. And these were configured as attackers or as victims. This is t and to generate traffic, we used video tree streaming, trapping, BGP, HTTP, etc., which is normal traffic. And for attack traffic, we used the same tools that we had used for the data sets. And it is important to consider here that all these tools used for this deployment are open source. Let me go back here to show you where each of the components of the architecture are located. And this is a monitoring part on the right. This is a component that collects the packets and changing these two flows that will be used by the IDS and the IPS. Where are the IDS and the IPS? They are connected at the top on the right. The both were installed in one single computer, the IDS and the IPS, and the controller which is in charge of managing the entire network and of receiving all the results of the IDS and then pass them to flow rules that will be then installed in the switches. This controller is located at the top on the left. So here, when assessing the performance in terms of response time, this won't be as fast compared to the simulation because here we also observe that there are elements between the different components of our infrastructure. For example, there is a router here that is connected and manages the entire management network of our deployment. There are two important contributions of this part of the assessment in a physical infrastructure. One is a data set with the traffic generated in our experiments. This has been published in the link that you have over here, and it's freely available. And the idea of publishing these data sets is that many of us who are in the academia do not have data, real data, or lists. So what we do is to use data sets to generate different machine learning models. So if we had the opportunity of deploying our infrastructure and of generating traffic, we can share this information with more researchers so that they can develop more intrusion detection systems that are closer to reality. One of the other contributions of this work is sharing the results of our framework. On the left, we observe some ex results of the experiments, in this case, we varied the number of attackers, which is variable, and the number of victims. Here we included more victims. And once again, we deployed the attacks. We measured each of the parameters. In this case, we are directly showing the percentage of attackers that were blocked in the network by our IPS. And what we see is that as uh, the number of attackers increases and the number of victims increases, it's much more difficult for our EDS to detect them, and therefore the MPS won't be able to mitigate them adequately. However, this should not, should not matter in our results, but if you look at that, the 
percentage of attacker, of attackers blocked is over 90 percent. What are the conclusions? Well, we designed uh, a smart and automated uh, system for uh, uh, mitigating uh, attacks uh, based on machine learning and deep learning. And uh, well, this uh, infrastructure now has a proactive part in addition to the reactive part. The reactive part means that we have two steps, detection and mitigation. And that's what we presented here. The proactive part is mechanism that try to prevent the attack by making some changes in the network to make it more difficult to the attacker to intrude. This part of prevention is something we've worked out and in the code that we are sharing and that I'll show, uh, show you in a while, it's included. In the yields part, we experimented a lot, model by model, to check the efficiency of each uh, of these elements. And in a nutshell, we can say that using data sets, we reach yields over 99%. Many studies had already conducted uh, experiments like this, but we wanted to check that if uh, we conserve uh, this performance when we deploy in simulation and uh, with physical infrastructure. With a simple deployment of uh, simulation, we already see that the percentage goes down to 98%. And when we tried it deployed, you saw the results in the previous slide. It is somehow maintained, but there's also a reduction in performance. In the LSTM model, that was the one that we used since we defined this with the data set, that these are the ones that uh, gave us the best results. We did some variations in the number of attacks, the number of connections per attack, the number of victims trying to reach this, uh, these systems to something realistic. Now, as to some results of mitigation, that we presented here, 100% efficiency for one and four attackers, and this is reduced as we increase the number of attackers. An important thing to consider here is that we are using a filter when we do um, because we we use a system and we are uh, so. Uh, we implement a filter to mitigate part of the traffic in the network and to use that. And that is why we can justify some uh, uh, problems, or maybe because in the proportion when we don't analyze the traffic, it's where the the, the traffic that could have uh, enabled us to correctly identify the attack. All the resources presented here are published in articles. All the, it's all open source in the GitHub account if you want to explore them. And in the data sets, those are open source. As to future work, we continue in the same line, trying to find solutions that may enable us to scale up uh, using, for instance, network function virtualization, NFV, and P4, the decision-making system in the data plane. That is, we don't want to capture the data in the device and send them to an external device for decision-making, but uh, to to uh, make decisions in the same switch. These are the alternatives that we are exploring at present. And just to conclude, uh, let me thank the FRIDA program. Uh, uh, FIDA, FRIDA funded this in research and uh, it uh, enabled us to present this, to have these results. I highlight the data set. You may find many data sets available and uh, uh, denial of service, but they are based on packets. Uh, ours is based on uh, flows. Um, 
Eusta at CDNs. So if you want to work in CDN, this is the only data center that you'll find available and uh, free of charge. Anyway, just as Frida presented it, we are releasing the code of the entire project of the models delivered and the entire data set. So if anybody wants to make any tests, we know that here there are many people from IXPs. So if you want to test it in your networks, it's just a matter of downloading the information and to try deploying it. Thank you, Frida, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Uh, so we are going to answer a question, a more remote question in Zoom. And uh, let me give you a minute. Hello. Yes, the question, Elias Mayorga from Ecuador, and it goes as follows. We could add the standard of work of uh, attack control DDoS sensitivity, uh, taking I add so that reachable uh, metrics may give us a method trending to zero overheating. Sorry, we couldn't hear it well. Could you repeat it? It says, could you add in the framework, could you add the standard of DDoS control uh, in a, sen a sensitive control carrying AI so that the metrics may give us a metric tending to zero to uh, overheating? So I, I, because of the audio problems, I didn't uh, manage, I couldn't read everything. Well, yes, in the presentation we have our uh, mail, so if you can mail it to us, yeah, we can answer through the mail. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I had already seen the presentation, but I loved it again. The question. My question, you develop a framework where on the one hand you have learning and on the other hand mitigation using CDN overflow. My question is to what extent do you modularize it and would it be possible to implement something like that using what you already did in somewhere when you don't have uh, uh, control, injecting BGT rules. So that is if we could deploy this mod model without CDN. Yes, if the results of learning could be used using other mitigation techniques such as BGP. Yes, sure. Of course, one of the objectives of the architecture of our model and uh, was that each module would uh, stand alone and adding scalability and each of the modules can be replaced by any other thing. In that sense, the uh, identification model based on uh, AI uh, models can prevail and the deep enforced learning uh, for the CDN could be replaced for a mitigation module based on the introduction of VGP rules in an IXP. So it is feasible. And uh, the identification module that uh, the most uh, complex thing to develop, I think that it could be replaced. Yes, no problems. As a matter of fact, something that we maybe we didn't discuss is the mitigation module that we did based on um, uh, AI. It intended to help the fact of saying I'm going to block traffic right away because that is the easiest technique, but it's a bit risky because all the uh, techniques that identify malicious uh, um, uh, malware could uh, 
uh, post uh, uh, f uh, could have problems. So we may be may, uh, blocking legitimate uh, traffic. That is why we call uh, that uh, is a bit deeper. Now, your question is, yeah, for your question, yes, you could replace the model for an alternative mitigation technique. Thank you. So there was somebody there that had a question. So let's see, in this case, we are speaking of the computing engineer, Fernando Aranda. 